Okay, so hello everyone, and thank you very much for uh, for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure for me today to host uh, Professor Ricard Soler. He's professor at the University Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona, and external professor at the Santa Fe Institute. Actually, from the '97, so it's uh, almost 20 years there. So, as many of you probably know, the Santa Fe Institute is a very important. Uh, place institution for uh, complex systems and for the development of complexity science. It was uh, funded in 84, if I remember correctly, uh, involving also Nobel Prizes such as uh, Muri Gelman and Phil Anderson. So Ricard uh, is the lead of a very important uh, lab in Barcelona, the Complex Systems Lab, where he works uh, as on a lot of things, is a very interdisciplinary Physicist, physicist of uh, our days. He has work uh, spanning from computation using uh, molecular systems uh, to synthetic biology, to complex networks, uh, uh, a lot of applications to biology. He has works uh, on development of cancers. So, uh, and overall, he's very well known actually uh, for his works on uh, ecology, where he was among the first. Uh, to, uh, <clears throat> uh, to attack a variety of problems uh, of the, the dynamics of um, and, the, and the network structure of uh, ecological systems. So nowadays he is going to work, uh, sorry, no, no, today he's going to, to talk about uh, a, a paper that and a, a series of works that are um, of high interest for the community because they deal with uh, evolution and the logic behind evolution. It's, uh, it's an incredible topic. I had also the great opportunity to collaborate with him in a recent paper about, uh, about this. Uh, he will span on a lot of topics during this, uh, this talk. I asked him to not to be uh, too technical because uh, some parts require a lot of theoretical uh, may require a lot of theoretical background, so the, the level will be intermediate because I was supposing a lot of students uh, also being interested. And uh, um, I don't know if, how you want to do, if you want to do the, the questions during or at the end of the talk. Never mind. Again. Never mind, so uh, <clears throat> I, you, you will self-organize then. Okay, so if there is any question, you, you can try. So I stop talking and uh, Thank you again, Ricard, for coming. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. You hear me well? All right. So this is a peculiar uh, talk, as you will see. Uh, it's about a very ambitious uh, research project that is not uh, confined into the limits of some particular problem. And it has to do with a question that uh, can be in a way, formulated the following way. Imagine that you go to another planet and that uh, you have this, this proof that can uh, detect life, right? Of course, how you do it, we don't know very well, but imagine you can take samples, you can make pictures. There's a very old question that has been around, which is um, life somewhere else will be different from what we know here. Um, could be extremely different. Or, or maybe it's not. And the, the idea that I'm going to defend here is that in terms of the logic, the logic of living systems from molecular codes to ecosystems is unique, is universal. It's something that we'll find out anywhere, right? So as you can see, this is a very, very strong claim, right? And this project is a project about, or starts in a way, from problems that we have been exploring over the years about the possible and the actual. So uh, this is something that in biology is might not so typically used as a question, but you can ask yourself why some things are there in nature and why are not. And why are some strange creatures are there? I'm, I'm referring to strange creature, the one on the right. Um, and why not lions uh, with wings? Uh, why some things are not observable, right? Um, and that connects with um, a huge number of questions that are essentially unsolved. Uh, many of them now are the, at the core 
of uh, an exploration, uh, in many cases led by physicists, in some other cases by strong interactions between physicists and biologists. And the list of things have to do with um, evolutionary transitions. So we know that natural selection is an extremely powerful force that generates complexity. We'll, we'll go back into that at the end of the talk. Um, but the nature of innovations, how new things happen in evolution, how do you jump into life, into cells, into multicellularity, all the way up into language or consciousness? How that did, that did happen? Right? That's not something that natural selection only can explain. You need to bring something more. And there's many ways of connecting these ideas in contexts that actually involve um, problems that have attracted the attention of complexity sciences, not surprisingly, most of them statistical physicists, um, that had to do with um, the possibility, for example, that a lot of the complexity that we observe, a lot of the order that we observe comes for free, meaning that there's been no natural selection, that is structural, even mathematical properties that put the systems um, in the, the place they are, right? And there are a number of questions, I'm not going to the, the whole list because we don't have time, but there are a number of questions that have to do with another phase of the problem that I'm very interested in. my lab, we have, uh, we have been theoreticians for a long time, but we have a wet lab now, a synthetic biology wet lab. And synthetic biology for us is an opportunity of rephrasing these questions uh, in, in the way of, can we actually build the things? Can we actually build anything, right? And the more we know, the more clear is that we cannot do everything, right? The biology has also important constraints. So answering the question of what is possible and what is not, is not just an academic question about the possibilities of evolution. It's a question of what we can actually do and construct. And again, it's an important time now because for the first time in the century, you have the opportunity of, of engineering living matter. So um, the precursor of this paper came some years ago. Uh, I organized this, this uh, workshop at the Santa Fe Institute, um, inventing a term, synthetic evolutionary transitions, meaning that in biology, we talk about evolutionary transitions, as I mentioned before, as these big jumps into new complexity, right? From cells to multicellular, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what I brought was the idea that we can maybe go into a new synthesis by looking at the possibilities of us uh, recreating the transitions using synthetic biology, so building or pushing systems into transitions, uh, evolutionary robotics, uh, artificial life, et cetera, et cetera. And that's my main contribution here, the idea that um, we can actually look for a new theoretical synthesis. And to a large extent, the underlying idea that I present in that paper is that um, going from origins of life to language and synthetic ecosystems and synthetic minds, um, every single problem contains a potential phase transition. And in physics, phase transition is a language that we know well and that allows us to formalize things in, in you know, rigorous ways. And the question is, uh, can we actually bring that theory into evolutionary innovations? All right. So... I'm going to four, four demons, right? Uh, to actually make a first reflection about um, prediction, the possible and the actual, and, and the limits for that, right? I, I start with Laplace demon. I guess most of you know, Laplace uh, had this idea uh, with uh, the rise of, um, of Newtonian dynamics that maybe we determine the position and velocity of every single particle if we were able to do that. We will know everything from the future. Everything is known. And actually, if you rewind the tape, you will know everything about the past. Right? So in a way, time has no, no secrets. And this was reinforced, of course, by many uh, things at the time, like uh, the return of Halley's comet, the predictability of Newtonian dynamics. And most people think that in physics, this kind of potential for prediction is uh, absolute. Right? But in fact, um, there are two things to mention. One is the idea of emergent phenomena, which is at the core of complex systems. Emerging uh, phenomena, uh, for me, the definition of complexity is related with this idea that you have a system made of many elements, 
These elements interact, and the interaction creates new phenomena that cannot be reduced to the properties of the individuals, right? You can spend your whole life looking at single termites. You will never understand how the termites built a nest, which is three orders of magnitude larger than them. And same for the brain, right? This hyper-reductionism doesn't bring you anything in terms of emergence. And also, I would like to just point you into this paper, The Theory of Everything, which is, is actually a critic to this idea that uh, once you have a physics theory, which is really detailed, everything is going to be explained, right? But the truth is that not even chemistry can be reduced to physics, right? And so the whole hierarchy is questionable. Then there's a very important uh, demon here, which uh, I call the, demo, the ghouls demon. Um, there's a, a duality of problems related with the possible and the actual that had to do with the nature of evolution. This is the idea that evolution is very historical. Uh, and Stephen Jay Gould said that if you were able to go back in time at, uh, at the Cambrian explosion and then run again the, the tape of evolution, you will observe a planet that will be completely alien, totally different. Because every single historical event changes the future in a probably dramatic way. Well, is that truly the, the, really the case? I put this little thing here. He has this very famous uh, book, oh, sorry, uh, called uh, Wonderful Life, which is based on, the, on this movie that you probably have seen. I mean, I visit in Spain every single Christmas. It's, it's shown there, right? It's Frank Capra's movie, a story of a guy who is a very nice guy. Um, at some point in his life, he, he feels like his life has been useless and he thinks uh, the world would be better if he hadn't been born, right? And of course, it's a movie. And then an angel, which is quite annoying character, uh, says, okay, let's, let's do the experiment. Let's see how the world will be if you haven't been born. And the story, to make it short, is that he saved his brother when he was a kid that, that uh, fell into a frozen lake from dying. And his brother saved uh, a group of soldiers in the Second World War. He was a hero. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what happens in the end is that because he wasn't born, the whole world would be totally different, right? That's, that's the idea. Is that, is that really true? That we, we start from some particular combination of uh, animals and we go through a uh, evolutionary process, things can be extremely different. My point here is no, it's not. Um, one of the strong arguments, um, against this idea that evolution is just historical, right? Is the, the observation of convergence. In, in, in life, we observe again and again that some particular solutions are, are obtained independently many times. For example, our eyes, this, this camera eye, has been invented maybe 25 times independently in very different groups of animals. And from single, single cells, believe it or not, to octopi or, or ourselves. And the solution is the same, right? Is this because it's an optimal? Is this because it's something that evolution cannot do better in, in any way? Then we call that evolutionary convergence. And people like Per Alberg there, uh, which was uh, one of the strong proponents of that, or Brian Wubin, who was my mentor, uh, argued a lot about the possibility that because there are physical and even mathematical constraints, the, pos the potential for evolution is a strongly limited. And this book, which I recommend very much, is a very, very interesting book. Life Solution sounds like a self-help book, but it's not, right? It's no solution for your life. It's, it's about convergence, the massive amount of convergence that is there. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, development, and I put here kind of the molecular machinery, and here the outcome of the molecular machinery here, in development, right, is a lot of constraints about what is, can be actually generated, right? And the fact that there's a mapping between genotype and phenotype that is non-trivial is what actually makes evolution difficult. All right, and a final, a final demon. Stuart Kaufman, um, a good friend of mine, uh, despite all the crazy things that he says sometimes, 
Uh, he proposed the idea that because evolution happens in a combinatorial space, so you can actually create by combining, you can create more and more complex objects, right? I'm, I'm making the story very simple. Uh, he called the, the problem of the adjacent possible. You have this current situation, and what can be next from evolutionary paths? And what he, he says, in a way, is that the potential combinatorial space here, it's so big, which you actually cannot say anything about prediction. And he actually says that there's no possibility for a predictive theory of evolution, right? Okay, so I just put here Stan, Stan Lamb. This, this is uh, one example of the many in science fiction where they put you in the context of potential life forms that are different from what we know, right? Don't want to make spoilers. It's just they go into a planet where it's a kind of a crystal-like nano systems that self-replicate, right? I don't think this is possible, but anyways. So anyways, um, I was thinking in this for many years. And um, uh, in November last year, I met, um, the, I had the great idea of in Santa Fe to put together a bunch of very smart people, right? And go with the idea that the more we are, the more funny it's going to be. Uh, Believe me, if you do that sometime, think about it twice. Anyway, um, this is really great, great people. And in this paper, which is still still under, under review, but hopefully will be very soon out. We put some of the ideas I'm going to discuss, which have to do with the search for these universal principles, the logic of leading systems, right? Uh, knowing that there are universals from physics, um, that information theory puts constraints into a number of things that can happen. And if in biology, information is extremely tied each to other. You will see artificial life tell us some really interesting things. And also synthetic biology uh, is relevant. And a peculiar thing that we will introduce. Some people, some pioneers, some visionaries can, could actually foresee some of the things that actually we consider these uh, fundamental logic constraints. So first, first thing, is there a universal logic of information coding? Um, can molecular information avoid linear polymers? Uh, the reason I am addressing that is that, as you know, in biology, uh, you, you have uh, DNA, RNA, you have linear chains that code, right? That can code information, right? So. What can be said about that if you don't know molecular biology? And the historical account is that Schrodinger, which has this little book called, is very, very uh, non-ambitious, What is Life? Um, in that book, along all the things about thermodynamics, which also we also bring in the, in the paper I want to mention, um, mentions the idea that whatever is uh, responsible for molecular information and heredity has to be uh, how do you say that? Um, a disorganized crystal, something like that, right? I don't remember exactly the term. Which means that there has to be some regularity inside to make it possible replication in a regular, predictable way, but a disordered crystal. But it has to be some disorder inside because you need to store information somehow, right? What not so many people know is about this guy, Kolsov, which I myself confess I discovered a couple of years ago. Uh, Kolsov, uh, a Russian guy, he also thought about that. And in 1927, which is years before Schrodinger, which was years before molecular biology and, and the, any knowledge about DNA or proteins or anything, um, he ended up with the conclusion that the molecules responsible for, for heredity had to be giant linear molecules, complementary, that he said will replicate in a semi-conservative way, which I think is just breaks, breaks my, my mind, blows my mind, right? Because that's exactly how DNA works, right? Giant molecules that are complementary and that replicate in semi-conservative ways. This has, uh, this has been uh, quite a visionary picture because uh, molecular biology was years ahead before we even know about what DNA was. And with the rise of molecular biology, um, many concepts from information theory, which was also under development at that time, translation, uh, transcription, all these concepts went into molecular biology in a very easy way. And it was quite 
easy to actually think that maybe computation also is, is relevant. And it's nice to see something that I think you have to pay attention to this. If I ask you, how will you store information in some molecular substrate that can be read, right? Because it's not enough to store information. I mean, if you look at the tree trunks, you have all these rings and we can read that. The plant cannot, so that's useless. So it can be read. It's very easy that every single person in this room ends up into an idea that is, well, a linear thing. It's a nice thing to do. And something that can be read, right? And store is something that already happens in our cells, right? In, in, at different levels, okay? And it's interesting because Turing himself, Alan Turing, has a very general model of computation and in part for historical reasons, he actually ended up with this idea that you can actually build uh, an extraordinarily complex computational machine by thinking in terms, very abstract terms, as a linear uh, tape and some machine that reads, reads and, and writes, right? How interesting, right? Because that's in a way precisely what we see inside uh, ourselves. So there's a Turing machine if you want to build at home, it's the video somewhere with Lego. Okay, oops, sorry. Okay. Don't leave, All right? Okay. So um, the first point I'm going to make, linear molecules that could be read by molecules that are machines that can go here and there, right? Um, might be the only solution. Why I'm saying that? Well, linear polymer is something that is one possible path into prebiotic chemistry. Polymers are something, things that can emerge. On the other hand, a polymer imposes, a uh, linear polymer, a very strong constraint to the way you store and read information because you have to move into this single direction. It's no, it's no much choice for mistakes, okay? And you could think, okay, but why not two-dimensional substrates? Could be. And actually, in, in computer theory, there are, uh, as for everything else, uh, work on what if I make a 2D machine that has a, a two-dimensional tape? Well, nothing really interesting happens. That, that is totally captured by a single uh, linear tape. Nothing else is, is there. So our first conjecture is molecular information allowing storage and processing requires necessarily linear polymers, meaning that if we were right, wherever you look for life, you should expect linear polymers to be there, right? And that puts a lot of constraints because Think about it. Who could be the candidates for that? There's more, more stuff uh, here, right? But who could be the candidates? It has to be uh, linear polymers means that every single monomer has to have two connections only, right? This has to be something that is pretty neutral because you want things that can be attached and detached easily with the same probability, essentially, which, which is what we see actually in, in DNA, for example. And, um, who are the candidates? Well, the interesting thing is that there are not so many candidates that allow for linear chains, right? Nucleotides, that's for sure, right? And amino acids. Okay, so um, the follow-up of that is maybe the constraints are on the chemistry also, right? Okay, what about cells? So we all recognize cells as the fundamental unit of life. Today, every single thing that is in the biosphere is a single cell or it belongs to a multicellular assembly, right? Could it be something different, something different in the logic uh, there? Well, again, let me put the historical context. John von Neumann, at the end of his life, was extremely interested in, in biology and in particular in the problem of how can I build a self-replicating machine? He was a mathematician. And that was all, again, ahead molecular biology. And people really understood how cells replicate and what is the information. There. And to make a long story short, for Neumann ended up with an idea, which is that you have to have a description of the machine inside. So I will say the information that has to guide the whole process of replication, having some pieces like the duplicator, the controller, that he defines in a very abstract way. 
right? As logical parts. And that when the, the machine replicates, has to replicate the information in the new machine. Now, if you know about biology, and if you show this to any biologist, he will say, yes, this is what happens in a cell, right? I have polymerases, I have regulatory systems, and I have DNA. It's easy to recognize. How interesting is that? Because that means that for Neumann ended up in the logic of how single cells should uh, replicate. He was thinking in machines in general, which is exactly what we see in biology. Meaning, that's our conjecture again, that probably the logic of living cells is a single one, is universal, is what von Neumann predicted. Of course, there's many things that we have to add to this problem. We work on that uh, for a while, on how you make physically self-replicating cells. Uh, you can have cells that have no information and just using standard interaction potentials between uh, lipids and a very little chemical reactions. You can actually show that you can construct a life cycle of a protocell, a division, right? Um, and an important message of this is that you can actually, some of the von Neumann components, like the, 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 the part has to do with regu regulating the replication, can be uh, embedded into soft matter. That the, the rules that are involved in creating, for example, micelles, promote some kind of regulation that is physical, it's not algorithmic, okay? But beyond that, and I want to point out, this is a very interesting time to solve a problem that is still there. In, in models of the origins of cells, people still is working with models where cells replicate somehow, right? So I have a cell of size N, and then it splits, okay? But this split is kind of magic. Uh, there's physics there, right? How, how do you actually, and that's a deep question. The question goes into the physics. How do you create a system that using interactions between molecules creates negative curvature? This stabilizes vesicles and allows replications to happen. But anyways, main part of this part of this conjecture in terms of cells. Cells are the fundamental units of life, have to be, right? So it's a logic. Uh, there, and the logic is describable by the von Neumann scheme, okay? All right, so there's another part of the story, which is information, cognition, uh, an, an important part because biology, and that's again, what is making so interesting the connections between physics and information theory, like in stochastic thermodynamics, um, information plays an extremely important role. This is a paper by John Hopfield, you probably have heard about John Hopfield, right, from the Hopfield model, uh, that not so many people knows, which is a, makes a very good point about the idea that what makes different biology from physics? And the point he makes is computation. Computation in what sense? In the sense that they have autonomous systems that are able to perceive an environment, perform changes inside, and respond to that in a, an adaptive way, right? That's something that we don't observe in non-living matter. Okay. So again, in, in cognition, there are many, many, many things that we don't observe, right? And I want to point into some uh, work that we have also been done, also started with a, a workshop at the Santa Fe Institute on what we call liquid brains. So how do you try to make a general theory based on physics and constraints about the different kinds of cognition, meaning that our brains are in a loose sense, solid, right? Neurons located in specific points in space once embryogenesis is finished and every, all the fun happens in interactions, in the connections, right? But this is essentially a static. Whereas for ant colonies, for example, you have a brain made of brains, right? Which is liquid, right? And one of the important things we've been working on the, on the last years is to actually show that if you are liquid, that imposes a lot of constraints into the cognition you can achieve, which is much, much, much slower, smaller than that for a solid brain. Nowadays, it's a very interesting time to think about that. Uh, there's a lot of literature emerging. Uh, to, for my taste, there's a lot of nonsense that also has, has been said about consciousness and all that kind of stuff. But this is an interesting time because all these complex networks that have been there for many years uh, now are becoming, for good or for bad, 
um, relevant. And let me make just a mention of this paper we, we wrote with one of my former students, Luis Ioane. Um, it's interesting to see that advances in artificial intelligence are happening uh, more and more uh, when you consider parts of the historical development of brains. Embodiment is very important. We have been conscious of that for a long time, but bringing uh, intelligent, so to speak, sorry for abusing language, right? Uh, artificial intelligence into robots that are actual, uh, have actual embodiments can change a lot of things. Um, interaction, social interactions, that's been extremely important for us. We are a cooperative species. We have been successful because we cooperate, right? I know that when you put the, the TV these days, that doesn't seem like that. But we have been successful because of that. And in this paper, we actually point, and it's connected with the, the, the work we are discussing here, that we think that everything that can happen that was a real artificial intelligence has to follow the path that brains have followed in evolution. And for example, that's one particular point I want to make, which is also in the paper. When you look at the way brains uh, work in terms of the fundamental units, what do you observe? For every single animal that has a, a, a neural system, you have neurons, which is this, have this amazingly complex uh, kind of shape, right? I always tell my students, why this shape? Well, when you look at hepatic cells, uh, pancreatic cells, um, cells from, from the kidney, you can see specializations, right? What is the specialization here? Look at the branches. I'm looking for connections, right? This, this is the specialization because information is what they do, is the central thing. But neurons are very universal. Neurons also have been there, uh, could be reimagined in different ways. They are highly polarized systems that send information in this direction. And as much as we know, they are threshold units. So once the amount of input here, stimulation, uh, crosses a threshold, they fire, right? Those of you who work in neuroscience, you know that this is a simplified picture, but this is essentially the picture we use. So why is that? And why is that that when we look at regulatory networks within cells, we also find out and we can formalize the same way, right? Like this maculot pitts scheme that you have, you need a, a, an amount of inputs, thresholds, right? Well, this is important because we, we believe that this in fact makes the potential outcomes of uh, neural-based systems, again, constrained in a number of ways, right? But one of the reasons is, let me see what is here. One of the reasons is that if neurons is the only solution, meaning polarized threshold units, that imposes a lot of limitations of what you can build from that. For example, you can build, use, use multi-layers, and multi-layers is standard in biology, right? Just give a look to the vertebrate brains or the octopi brains, yeah, multi-layers. Um, in artificial intelligence, people are using multi-layers, right? Why not something else? And that's something I've been working recently with some colleague and the idea is that maybe we can show that if you evolve cellular structures that exchange information, start starting from scratch, but nothing interesting, maybe we can end up into designs that are polarized units with threshold function. And that would be the only possibility for the logic of these systems, right? This is just, if you want to give a look to the paper I mentioned before, that, that brought us into the idea of looking at the space of possible cognitions, but that's another story, right? Um, the language, because language is one of these particularly interesting things that um, in evolutionary biology is considered the most difficult problem, how language emerge. Um, language is a real puzzle because language has this huge complexity. Uh, language is, is in the end, the big piece that makes us different when, when, when somebody asks, is the brain the most complex object in the universe? I don't know, but the brain has access, access to the infinite, right? Because you have recursive language and the potential of using this recursivity to think much beyond any finite thing, right? So it's multiple scales involved. And 
somebody can say, can say that language doesn't leave fossils. So how do you know about um, the, the path followed by language? But that's not completely true. There are things about cognition that have left fossils, right? Um, does anyone want to see a regularity here? There's a pattern here. This is made by many different people, but there's a pattern. There's a, there's a common thing. All left hands, exactly, yeah. Why? Because the, whoever was doing that is putting the left hand and using the other one to paint, right? So you were right-handed right as, as we are. The majority of people is right-handed. So at least this tells us something about, uh, in that time, this kind of preponderance of right-handed people, right, which has a lot of different implications, right, was there. But that's more, much more interesting than that, right? Um, when you look at the old paintings of people in the in the in the prehistorical times, what we see is that the mind is already there. This is for the first time people is is uh, creating information that is not addressed for someone who is there. It's created for whoever comes afterwards, right? It's a, a clear abstraction. I just put this book here because one of my favorite books, The Gap, is an amazingly interesting book about the singularity of the human mind. I extremely recommend it. So language has many layers of complexity. Um, if you look at the literature of theory, of evolutionary theory of language, you'll find out all kinds of fascinating things from um, the work that people like uh, Kakao and Novak did about thinking about how, how, what are the first constraints I need in a, in a language that has to be spread uh, as an infection between people. And, and there's a lot of similarities, actually universals, between the noise requirements, because noise played uh, an, an active role, probably, in the first forms of language. And you look at the literature and you will find out all kinds of things from the small level of words and, and letters to all the way up into um, how language is in, embedded into neural systems. I just want to point out into one particular thing that we work out for many years which is the Zipp's law. Some of you might, might already know. Um, if, you go, if you go to another country, the language is something that you might not understand. But you, if you look at the statistics of language, and you take, for example, written text, this is from, I think, Moby Dick, uh, take the first chapter or the whole book and count how many times it, each word appears and order the, 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 the uh, words in rank, so the, the most common word appears that number of times. The, more, the second, that, the third, that. This is log log scale, this is a, a power log with exponent about minus one. And it's pretty much universal, right? So why is that? And there's been a lot of controversy about if this is uh, just a trivial result because it appears in other contexts. So in, in language, we, uh, we advanced with one of, one of my former students, this idea that, um, there was a, an idea from Zips himself. He said that language emerges from a tension between efforts, between the speaker and the hearer, right? Um, imagine that with, with an abstraction of the neural substrate, right? Imagine that you have a speaker and a hearer. Uh, if I'm the speaker, the most, the least, the least costly thing that I can do is to use two or three words to refer to everything, right? But for you, the hearers, that is a nightmare. How do you decode that, right? Whereas for me, the higher cost would be to use a single term for a single object for action. For you, it will be the least effort because you will fully understand what I'm referring to. So what Steve was suggesting is that it has to be a conflict for physicists that sounds, right? Like phase transitions, a conflict between uh, energy and entropy and things like that. So to make the long story short, we formulated that in a, in a rigorous way using information theory, using two measures, one for the cost of the speaker, which is essentially entropy, how many words I'm using, and then the cost of the hearer, which is a, a conditional entropy, which essentially says how good I am to actually decode, right? So you can do that. Uh, you can do that and weight it in the, in the right way. And what we found out is that there's a phase transition. When you go from, uh, you order the, the efforts 
from the least effort of the heater to the highest effort. It is a phase transition between a graph, which essentially is I'm, I'm a really bad person and I'm using a single word to refer to everything, right? So you guys are completely confused. Or I'm one-to-one, -one, which is something that in computational linguistics is kind of the, the goal, right? Have a system that one by one can might make a mapping word, object, word, action, right? One by one. But the interesting thing that happened is that at the phase transition between the both, both um, the work, well, anyways, you see the phase transition here, right? Right there, Zeeb's law emerges as a conflict between uh, the two strong constraints. Uh, we, we expanded this theory using a very nice uh, formalism that essentially uses um, um, uh, a Lagrangian uh, approximation to the problem and show that if you have a system, a language that grows in time, right, it, it ends up in Zipp's law. Just to briefly mention that there's more layers of complexity here, for example, networks, right? Um, one of the nice things we discovered at the beginning of the century, right, with the revolution of networks, is that in in complex systems, sorry, in, in language, you can define networks. And was, that was one of the first examples of a network that was defined. This comes, as you, as you probably knew, from Moby Dick, right? First chapter, we put what? We connect two words. Every single node here is a word, right? In a put a connection, they don't show the arrow here, but the put a connection, if two words appear one after the other, at least within one sentence, right? So the question we are trying to address here, which is, which is this kind of a production network, is um, I can formulate the following way. When you construct sentences, you, you, for example, you're, speak, you're, you're talking, you know that every sentence has a grammatical structure. There are rules for construction. But you, you don't stop to do that. You don't first look at the syntactic tree, see if everything is correct. You just go on. Right? So we navigate extremely easily in this um, collection of words, which can be 50,000, maybe even 100,000, believe it or not. Uh, you know a lot of words, right? Uh, for professional football players, this is much smaller. And the thing is that what we found is that this is not a small world. It has a lot of structure. Um, some words, are like, for example, prepositions, right, are ambiguous. They have a huge amount of connections. And they made the networks extremely navigable, right? You can navigate very easily because the, the average path length is very small. Here are small worlds, okay? There's a lot of things that have to do with the syntax because a lot of the syntactic structure is captured here. Just want to mention for those of you who want to actually check, um, syn syntax is the kind of the really big thing. Right? How do you explain? How do you explain, for example, that children start not talking, using one word, then two words, but there's no such a thing as the phase of three words. They jump at about two years, they jump into the whole complexity of grammar, right? It's quite a spectacular thing. From, we say from two to infinity. So how does it happen? And it's, you can imagine, that's an extremely difficult problem. I want to point out in this work, I think it's kind of potentially groundbreaking by by the Gilly, what he suggests that look at spin glasses. Spin glasses have this um, hypermetric structure. There is an intrinsic hierarchy there. And if you look at the paper, he suggests a phase transition that could be uh, behind the structure of syntactic systems. Well, a lot of work is ongoing about making robots that actually use natural language. I think we'll see a very interesting time the future this is for uh, a work of Luke Stills on using robots that communicate and that surprisingly they, there's a, a grammar that emerges in the system that was not programmed. So the evolution of robotic communication can lead into proto-grammars, which is exceptional. And we, we formulate the idea that universal ZPM communication might be inevitable. You have a complex language, right? And finally, almost finally, what about ecosystems? And you might think, well, ecosystems, that means a lot of species, diversity. Well, um, one of the first things to mention is that um, 
And that's a problem that I think we need to solve, sort out in some way uh, for ecosystems, but also for cells. Why so much complexity? So why so many species in the case of the college? And Ramon Margalef, who was one of my, also my, my teachers at the university, he was pointing into that again and again. Why so many species, right? We could imagine a planet with just one species of bacterium that covers everything, right? Well, the idea about the precursors, uh, there's been people who actually thought about uh, kind of make artificial ecologies. And I just want to point out that this happened in the 40s by Niels Barrichelli, who used the first computer, the von Neumann uh, computer, uh, to actually make the first simulations of evolving uh, artificial systems, which were essentially uh, symbols in chains. This is a space-time diagram, right? This would be different kinds of uh, organisms, and this is time, right? He could observe several things. The first thing I want to point out is viruses. Parasites appear, appear immediately. Parasites appear immediately and were really a problem. But the most important result um, is what Tom Ray found out, uh, which again, I'm going to explain quickly. Tom Ray, he, he's an ecologist, a, a real field ecologist. He was very interested in the problem of why how many species and why ecology, ecosystems are organized the way you observe. So he did some groundbreaking experiment, which is I'm going to build an ecology in my computer, right? And this is the late 80s. And so what he did, and I explained very quickly, is imagine I can put a bunch of programs, identical, within my computer. So the memory in my computer will be the ground for competition, right? Who can occupy the CPU of my system? And he allowed the programs to make little mistakes. So you could actually replicate uh, and build a program that was there uh, and make a mistake. Some part of the code may be, uh, may be uh, a mutation, if you want. What well, he observed is, first of all, he observed that some new class of uh, code, sorry, programs appear, which replicate faster because they were shorter. So they just uh, allow some parts of the code to disappear, right? Like to replicate and invade it the system. Then he observed shorter programs. But since he was like God, he, he could be checking out what was happening exactly. These shorter codes were unable to replicate by themselves. They use other codes to replicate. So parasites. And then uh, another kind of shorter codes appear, which infected the parasites, what in biology we call hyperparasites. Then some Problems discovered something interesting, which is if I scramble the code, right? If I recombine with another code, I might escape parasites, right? So what we call recombination, or if you want to use a more fancy word, sex, right? Sex is also invented there. And finally, he discovered at the end that some groups of codes, none of which was really good in replicating, were much faster than anyone else because they cooperated, right? Not bad, right? I mean, if, if you're not impressed by that, there's nothing I can say that gonna impress you. You are in, a, in an ecological context that is not living systems, it's not biology, it's not living matter. But uh, you replicate exactly the same in terms of the logic that we observe in ecological systems. Remember the question by Gould, right? You can go back in time and rewind the tape of evolution. That's our experiment for that, okay? In terms of the logic, seems inescapable. Our, our conjecture is that there are two things to say. When you look at ecosystems today, you can perfectly classify the classes of interactions among organisms. And it's a finite number of uh, interactions and there's nothing else, right? And if you try to do that with synthetic biology, it's nothing else. And parasites seem to be inevitable, right? And if you, if you think in the trees of evolution, not like uh, the one I observed, but like trees which carry functions, one of these branches will be parasites. It's totally inevitable, right? And so our conjecture here is what is possible in ecological networks is totally constrained by some particular evolutionary properties, right? And parasites are inevitable. Every single thing I'm saying as a conjecture needs to be formulated as a conjecture, right? In a rigorous way. 
And I'm, I'm just finishing. One final question to ask. So natural selection is there. It's something that has been operating and is operating in our biosphere. Um, there's a context where we can actually play with in terms of the, as I mentioned before, the Wuxia transitions as phase transitions. There are several very good examples of that. Um, it has been suggested actually that natural selection itself may be the result of a phase transition. Why? Because there's a legitimate question to ask. Is natural selection the only way I can generate complexity in living systems? Could it be in an alternative biosphere, some other mechanism that has not to do with selection and mutation that is able to generate complexity? That's an open, that's an open question. But just to finish, um, the, the role played by the, the conceptual framework evolution percolates many different areas. I like this citation by, by Leonard Suskin, right? Um, who says, actually, who claims that modern cosmology began with Darwin and Wallace. He uses that because cosmology, in a way, is about the, the origin and evolution of the universe, right? Which also experiences phase transitions. It is a lot of universality. So our conjecture is that natural selection is probably the only way of generating complexity, right? Once information replicators emerge, which is a precondition, right? That doesn't need to be the case right at the beginning. So every single thing here has to be transformed into a theory. So for us, it's a roadmap and it's a call to arms to try to push forward this. Some of these ideas are already being explored right now. And I just want to thank this kind of the outcome of many years uh, discussing things with very gifted colleagues, great PhD students. And I also want to point my original uh, complex system, systems lab. Uh, some people call it the authentic complex systems lab. Uh, you might recognize some people, Jordi Vasconte, Susana Manrubia, has been um, very gifted theoreticians. And I have a particularly fond memory of those years because we started with many of the questions that we are still pursuing. And for a very long time, we have no money because nobody believed that this idea of complexity was anything by crap. Um, but things have changed. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mika, for the very inspirational talk. So it's time for questions. Yes. Um, what is the role of chemistry in this? I mean, uh, these evolutionary uh, models uh, are valid also in biology, which is based on something else than uh, carbon and hydrogen, as it is our biology, bio, biology or? Uh... Well, uh, that's, that's not an, e an easy question to ask. It's, in, it's an important question because well, the first thing as a precondition for a biosphere has to do, has to do necessarily uh, about the units, the chemical units that are available. Uh, yeah, for example, everything points in the direction that, for example, a silicon alternative is extremely unlikely to ever work for two reasons. One is the carbon, which is a very nicely combinatorially work working molecule, uh, sorry, atom, um, is there, is available much more than silica. And also that despite science fiction is filled about stories about uh, silicon organisms, the energy bonds, the real combinatorial, the, the combinatorial you can do about that is incredibly limited compared with carbon. So uh, in terms of the precursors of the chemistry, I, I also think that anything that happens in some other alternative exoplanet will be based on our carbon chemistry, like the one we know here. Any other questions? This way you will report. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was really interesting. I was just wondering, uh, in many cultural evolution studies, uh, scientists try to fit cultural evolution onto uh, the models built in evolutionary biology. 
where do you think cultural evolution might fit in all this? So can you repeat the question? I'm not sure. I understand. Uh, yes. So basically, uh, often in cultural evolution, so cultural that, evolution. yeah, cultural evolution, uh, they try to fit the models on two models the developed in evolutionary biology. Uh, but do you think this might also be applied, like with this case, like where do you think cultural evolution fits oh, in great. all this? Okay, very good question. Um, we are working on, on some of that, for example, for, um, I'm going to give, give you my opinion because it's, it's a debatable thing. Um, of course, evolutionary biology has been inspiration because it's so well established. Um, but for example, things that we are working on, which uh, again, it had to do with potential universal phenomena uh, for agriculture, which is kind of one of these great inventions that requires cooperation, but also um, an engineering of ecosystems, engineering of the biosphere. And one of the things we wanted to address is agriculture emerges in several contexts, in insects in particular, but of course in humans. So how did that happen? Because it's, it's something, again, it's a, good, it's a good example because we have much more evidence for what might have happened. And one of the things that we have been working recently is um, using a, co a collective of artificial intelligence agents. So they start from scratch living in a landscape where you have plants, uh, but they have to discover something that is incredibly important, which, which has to do with prediction. They have to discover that the plants have seeds and that the seeds are actually the time machines, that the, the seed is a plant, right? Is, is the algorithmic representation. And if you, are, if you discover that, and you know how to uh, kind of influence the environment by carrying the seeds, putting the seeds somewhere, uh, protecting them from whatever it is. Um, agriculture could be, could be something that uh, we could explain with a theoretical framework. And the ambition is uh, for this and the other classes of agriculture you have in, for example, in leaf cutter ants or things like that, see where it comes from. And, it's, it's a long story, but uh, again, it's, it's nice that we follow on the one hand rules that have to do with cooperation and competition, but there are also some fundamental things that we think have to do with genetic phenomena, right? Like the way that you perceive the world, the way you are embodied in the world and your environment. So I think that whatever happens in the future will be a mixture of evolution and dynamics, because there's kind of fundamental rules, but cognitive part of the story that has not been yet put in place. I'm giving my, my perspective. Okay. Any other question? Everybody's convinced? Good. Actually, it's uh, perfectly on, on time uh, 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 as well. So. By the way, uh, Ricardo will be here up to tomorrow, uh, let's say around lunchtime, then he has to prepare for uh, going back home. If you have anything to ask, uh, drop in an email or get in touch with me and I will act as a, as a bridge. And we are going to have further discussions because uh, of the talk or so later after the seminar. So if you're around and you want to join, feel free. So let's thank the speaker again. Thanks again for coming.